Democracy is not a thing which is like the water, you know, you open the tap and water is coming. You know, it's with democracy, it's, it's not that way. You have to fight for democracy. We have to defend democracy. And that's now, I think, it's the moment to do it. It's very difficult to explain this surge of uh, uh, nationalism, xenophobia, um, and the rise of the right wing in, in a couple of words. But I think if we believed, all of us, uh, that uh, if uh, into, um, uh, that in 1989, that after 1989, what happened, the collapse of entire system, uh, of communism would pass without any, any kind of changes, any kind of effect, mental, political, economic, uh, cultural, I think we were, we were all uh, very much wrong. The other side is the influx of immigration which is fr from 2015 on, which is of immigrants, the great number of what they call wave of immigration, um, from 2015, uh, which is, I think, only the trigger in this surge of uh, right wing, which started much earlier, started some, uh, perhaps a, a decade ago. So basically, on both sides, there is some kind of anxiety on psychological level, anxiety and fear. And of course, fear breeds nationalism. It's not the other way around that nationalism breeds fear. It's fear that breeds nationalism, and then nationalism brings hatred, brings emotions. This is all what it is about. It's about emotions. We are now at the stage of, I think, politics of emotions, and uh, Viktor Orban is an example of that. And he is an example to Poles, he is an example to Czechs, he is an example to Croats, he is an example to Romanians, to Bulgarians. And that is not very, uh, very good, I would say. Um, in my opinion, uh, racism, xenophobia is really bred by different, different factors. Well, first, of course, it's migration. Without migration, without this uh, immigrant problem, which of course exists, uh, the right in, let's say, Austria or in Germany, they would be nowhere because they would have no cause. And on the other hand, what we observe at the moment is really that Eastern Europe is influencing very strongly the West. It was for many, many years, it was the other way around. It was always the West influencing the East and the East looking at the West and saying, ah, beautiful, now we want to get there. We want to reach their level. And now it's more and more that people look at Orban, maybe even Kaczynski, but definitely to Putin. You know, this is what we observe now is a Putinization of Western politics, like in Austria, in France. Putin is observing you know, the West and he's influencing very strongly the far right, extreme right. And I'm afraid that this is going on if we don't really stand up and stop it. You know, and this is each one of us is responsible for that, each one of us. So when we are speaking about uh, democracy, as Martin now mentioned, democracy, we should stand up and we should defend democracy. I think it's very, again, there is a gap between East and the West and it's visible in the way that in the Eastern European countries, in former Soviet, uh, Soviet bloc countries or Soviet Union for that matter, you don't really have democracy you have democratization, which means that people there in this short period uh, were not really 
um, able to have this crash course in democracy and to realize that it is them themselves who have to fight for it, to have, who are responsible and uh, uh, where, where big issues are standing on their shoulders. I for sure know that in Croatia this is, this is not the case. So uh, nation state, which is 30 years old, um, it's not the same like um, uh, states that, are, that had their uh, uh, nation state building uh, finished in the, I don't know, 100 or 200 years ago. And therefore, I don't think that when we say uh, we have to defend democracy, we, that everywhere people understand uh, that and how to do that. I think that in these new democratic countries or democratizing countries, this is not going to be very easy because there is still fear. There are still authoritarian governments, speaking of Orban or Kaczynski, for example. So it's um, it's uh, it's very difficult task from that point of view. Well, I think that you could, with some difficulty, of course, you could compare the old times, the communist times, with the new times. Because in communist times, I'm talking now mainly about Poland, which is the country I know best. In in the old times, in communist times, even the communists. Uh, were aware that nobody believed in communism. You know, it was very, very difficult in Poland, in communist Poland, to find a communist. You know, nobody believed in it. You know, not even the party officials. Nobody. I studied there, and my professors, they all said, no, we are definitely not communists, you know, but of course we have to pretend to be. So there was this vacuum, really. You know, it was ideological and, and you know, it's huge vacuum. And even then, they, tr they tried to fill it with some sort of nationalism, you know, and you can compare it with the language, you know, even then, they were, they were talking about the true Poles, you know, a good communist is a true Pole, you know, now a good, good Pole is a good Catholic, you know, there's, there's this difference, although not, maybe not so much, you know, and so it was quite easy, like in 68, you know, to raise this anti-Semitic campaign, you know, they expelled 30,000 Jews from Poland. So this didn't come from nowhere. You know, the feeling was already there that we are the true Poles and the Jews are not Poles, you know. So they made this distinction. And I think uh, what, I, what I observe, and this is not only Poland, is the similarity of the language. We are the Poles and the other ones are the enemies. You know, we don't trust them. So the whole world is really our enemy or whole Europe is our enemy, you know, except Orban maybe and, and some other countries. And we are true Poles and we have to resist them. And that was, in communist times, it was exactly the same. You know, it was the same kind of, of argument. So I think, you know, that, that in, uh, Subkutan, you know, in those days you could speak of, of nationalism and, and a fairly strong one. And this is not only Poland, this was also in Hungary already and in some other countries, like Romania, for instance. You know, I, I, I was very often in Romania. And there was uh, Ceausescu, of course, was relying on a very strong nationalism. You know, he was, he was the father of the nation, you know, and, and the nation and the Romanian nation, and we are proud to be Romanians, and, and all this jazz, you know. So sort of he was the uh, Tsar of Carpathia and, and, and all these things. That was a very nationalistic uh, kind of th thinking, in my opinion. Oh. 